Well, good evening. Welcome to our live broadcasts. And uh, if you've joined us regularly, it's good to see you again. Uh, if this is your first time, we do these every Tuesday. We study the Word of God. We're learning powerful truths and uh, helping you to understand the Bible, helping you to understand the Word of God. We've been looking at the healing ministry of Jesus and uh, examining each individual case where Jesus healed people and learning uh, some very amazing things that we can apply into our own lives so that we can know how to approach God, how to receive from God. So if you're excited, if you want to learn things from the Word of God, then uh, I encourage you to keep watching and to join us every Tuesday when we do these broadcasts. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Jairus. Uh, in Mark chapter 5, and learn some, uh, some exciting things. So if you're ready, I encourage you to open your Bibles and have a look with us. Mark chapter 5, we're going to be talking about how to approach God correctly. Uh, how the Bible lays out certain principles about how we're to come before God. And uh, if we can learn these and get the approach correct, I believe we'll get a lot more results. So I just want you to listen carefully. A lot of times people people don't uh, believe that we have to approach God any particular way. People cry out to God. They just, oh, God, help. Or they just uh, throw up a quick prayer, just quickly ask. But what we've seen in this series so far is that the approach matters. How we approach God actually matters. The way we come to Him. Now, I've I've looked at these principles in the series so far. But uh, I, I just felt we needed to do a summary of them and to clarify and to make this, uh, the, the, these truths a lot clearer through tonight's teaching and go through it step by step. Uh, the way we've been studying the ministry of Jesus is we've divided the, the healing cases into a couple of different groups. The first one is uh, looking at the people who came to Jesus, the people who actually approached Jesus uh, they came to him, the woman with the issue of blood, she came to Jesus. Jairus, he came to Jesus. And we've been looking at the people who approached Jesus for healing uh, and learning the, 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 the powerful keys that can help us in that situation. The, after that, we will look at the situations where Jesus went to the sick person. And you'll see some different principles are involved. But for now, we want to know how to approach God. We want to know when we're the one coming to him, when we're approaching God uh, for healing. Uh, really, these principles apply in any area. When you're coming to God and you are asking him for something, you're coming to God in prayer, or you're coming to ask somebody else to pray for you or to, to lay hands upon you, then the Bible shows us that uh, there's some important things that we need to get right. Jesus sometimes had to adjust people. He had to, uh, if they didn't approach quite correctly, he had to adjust them in some areas. And um, because of that, he was able to help them because he knew how to adjust them. He knew how to get it right. He, he knew how to show people the correct way to be when they come to God. And uh, by studying these cases, we can learn and get it right. Uh, what, I, what I want you to understand is that the approach matters. The way we approach God. The Bible lays down what I call protocol. It lays down the specific way we are to approach God. How we are to come before Him. Some people know some things. They know certain scriptures which say to come, come boldly to the throne room of grace. But there's others. There's, that is certainly one of the principles, but there's other things. And um, so tonight we're going to summarize some things. We're going to look at the approach. We're going to go through step by step the, the way to approach God and the way to, that, that he lays down in his word how we are to come to him. So, and a good teacher, you see, the reason I'm re repeating some of these principles, even though we've mentioned some of them previously, is a good teacher doesn't just mention things once. A good teacher makes sure that, that, that things are clear, that you go through things, come at things from different angles, so that people see it clearly and understand what the Word of God is saying in particular areas. So let's, let's go to Mark chapter 5. Hopefully uh, you've had some time to find the passage uh, if... if uh, while I've been talking, Mark chapter 5, and the same account is covered in, in three of the Gospels. It's also in Matthew 9, and it's in Luke 8. But we're primarily going to be using Mark chapter 5, and then we might reference some of the other uh, verses as well. But um, in Mark chapter 5, verse 21, Mark chapter 5 and verse 21 says this, 
Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My, Lord, my, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, actually, at that particular point, the, 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 this account splits because the, the woman with the issue of blood occurs. And we studied that last week. So uh, just for now, just for this teaching, uh, the first session today, because I'm going to be doing two sessions tonight. For the first session, um, we're going to just read that far. So let's just, let's just talk a little bit first about uh, Jairus' daughter, the condition she was in, and what the Bible tells us. Uh, we see from what Jairus said in Mark, um, it says, my little, lo- my little daughter lies at the point of death. She lies at the point of death. Uh, Luke, um, Luke says this, for he had an only daughter, this is Luke chapter 8 verse 42, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. Uh, so that tells, this is his only daughter, she's 12 years old, young girl, <clears throat> and she's dying. Um, can you imagine, I don't know if any of you are fathers, but if you've only got one daughter, I mean, it's, it's bad enough if any of your kids die, but this is his only daughter. Uh, I'm sure this, this this man felt desperate. I'm sure he f- was feeling the, the, the stress and the pain of this situation. And sometimes we, we don't really recognize that when we read these different um, Bible passages. But how would this man have been feeling the fact that his daughter is right on the point of death? Uh, in fact, Mark says, my, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Luke says she was dying. Uh, Matthew, the way it's translated in the English and Matthew says, my daughter has just died. But if you look at it, it's kind of got the idea of it's happening right now. In other words, it, she's dying right now. This, 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 is not just, this is not just a situation where this girl might die, you know, maybe in the next few weeks. Uh, this was certain. This is 100%. She was dying. It was happening right then, that day, that moment. Um, and, and this is not, she's eventually going to die or she's got a, a terminal illness. Now, please understand me, having a terminal illness is bad. I'm not saying that's, that's any better, but it, someone with a terminal illness is, is, might still have weeks or months. And, and that, you know, they've got time to get in the word of God and to get set free from this. This situation, this woman, this girl is dying right now. At the time this is happening, this isn't months or weeks away. Uh, it is so bad that she is in her last moments. Uh, she literally has moments left by the time Jairus comes to Jesus. Uh, and it's, it's, just think about this situation. Put yourself in this man's shoes a little bit, how he would be feeling. Uh, this man and his family, they were at their darkest, worst moment. It doesn't get a lot worse than this. This is, this is his only daughter. She is dying that day, that moment, within moments or hours of the situation. He knows she's on her deathbed. Um, now, to be honest with you, you know, where would, where would you normally be when your, your only daughter is dying? You'd be sitting right next to her. Under normal circumstances, you'd be sitting there saying your goodbyes, knowing that this is the last chance she'll ever get to talk to her. Uh, and but Jairus, Jairus is out looking for an answer. He's not given up, and I love that about this man. He has not given up when everything in the natural says he should have been sitting right by his daughter's deathbed, holding her hand, crying with the family, saying goodbye. He has not given up. He has not accepted the fact that this is the end, and he comes to Jesus, believing that things can change. How many people, when things are that close to ending, that close to death, sometimes maybe if people have weeks or months, they they believe God and they try prayer and they try different things. But when it gets to that last day or that last day or two and the doctors have said, sorry, it's going, there's nothing we can do. Death is imminent, could happen any minute. How many people at that time give up? on trying God, or maybe just say, well, you know, we tried, we, we had the pastor pray, we've had hands laid, we've had anointed with oil, we've done different things. So, well, look, it just doesn't look like it's work. 
and we're just going to give up. How many people, when, they, when, 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 when they're right in the day that death is happening, give up? Give up hope. But this man in, in Mark chapter 5, the, the Jairus, this man at the worst, the darkest moment of his life when his only daughter is right at the point of death and dying that very moment, he has not given up and he's coming to Jesus believing there's an answer. I believe that. I, I love that about this man. I love the fact that this man has not given up when everything you think he should be sitting by his daughter's deathbed holding her hand saying goodbye. Instead, he's coming to Jesus. He's coming to Jesus. However, his attitude when he comes to Jesus is very different to one of the previous cases we studied of the nobleman. The nobleman, his, he, he was also in it facing death, but he, he was so focused on the crosses that all he could say is help me please she's dying she's dying but Jairus has a completely different attitude when he speaks to Jesus we're going to look at that in a moment because I believe Jairus got the approach right he had he got he approached Jesus correctly and because of that Jesus went with them Jesus didn't have to correct his approach and uh, when he got it right Jesus started to go with him so let's look a little bit more of this let's look at how Jairus got it right let's look at his approach how he approached to Jesus in, in the darkest moment of his life when his daughter is dying that very moment he's approaching Jesus he's coming before Jesus believing there's an answer uh, so again, this healing comes under the cases of the people who came to Jesus, uh, all the different cases we've studied so far. Now, one of the things, let me just remind you, or a couple of the things, some of the things we've seen is that when, when you come to God, the Bible lays down protocol. It lays down in Hebrews eleven six. it says, he who comes to God must believe. Now, that's a requirement. When you are approaching God, believing is a, is a, is a biblical requirement. Uh, James 1 verse 6 says, uh, but it talks about asking for wisdom and says, but let him ask in faith. When you're coming to God to ask, faith is required. Believing is required. And, and one of the things and the reason I'm, 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 I'm recovering this in this particular teaching is I want this to be clear. I want you guys to learn to approach God correctly and to get it right every time. Uh, faith must be present. Believing must be present in the actual approach. When you come to God, this isn't a situation of approach however you feel and get faith present later. You see, many people, when they're under desperate circumstances, they just throw up a prayer in desperation. And then afterwards, they think about, well, let's try and get into faith about this. Or, or they kind of have, think, well, you know, passively in my heart, I believe. So, you know, I'm just going to cry out. And one of the things we learned with the, le with the two blind men, when they came to Jesus, they were crying out to Jesus. They were asking, have mercy. They were requesting, but there was no faith in their request. It's what I call a neutral request. It, it wasn't, they weren't unbelieving. They weren't in doubt. They weren't questioning what Jesus could do, but there wasn't any faith in their request either. They just asked. Now, the Bible doesn't say just ask. It says ask in faith. Faith must be present in the request itself. And I'm going to teach you how to do that tonight. I'm going to look at that. There needs to be words of faith, not just faith in your heart, words of faith. If, when you're requesting, because asking God is verbal. When you're asking, Father God, I'm asking you to heal in Jesus' name. Or, Lord, I need help. That's, that's not a prayer of faith. That's just a neutral prayer. We need to learn how to put faith into the request, how to approach God correctly. And so this is because the approach matters. And this is what we're looking at tonight. This is what we want to begin to see. The, if you can get the initial approach right, if you can come before God correctly, you'll find you get a lot more results. If we can follow the instructions. OK, so, you know, some of the other people we saw in uh, in the last few weeks, we looked at uh, the lunatic's son. He came. He was he was putting responsibility on everybody else. You do it for me. You do it for me. That's not the correct approach. The nobleman came and he was so desperate because of the difficulty he was facing that he that's all he could see. And he was like, help. I need help. I need help. That's not the right approach. Jesus had to adjust both of them. The blind men, as I mentioned, they they asked but they didn't put, include faith in the request. The leper, the leper came and we've studied him a few weeks ago. The leper came and he knelt before Jesus. He approached in humility 
and, and he acknowledged that Jesus could do it. If you are willing, you can make me whole. Now that's doing a bit better. Uh, I, in a sense, he had limited faith. He had he had partially present faith. He believed and he verbally acknowledged you can do it. But he was uncertain in some areas. So it's better than neutral requests. It's better than desperation and putting responsibility on everyone else. However, his faith still needed a little bit of a little bit of information and help. But then we've in the last few weeks, we saw the man born by four. They, when they approached, they came correctly. The Bible says Jesus saw their faith and, 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 and Jesus got involved and the man walked in forgiveness and healing. He got two, two, for, two for the price of one. Okay, The woman with the issue of blood, her approach was correct. She approached Jesus correctly. And, 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 and in fact, it, it, her faith was so, so correct that she was able to just touch Jesus and get her healing without even asking. So let's look. How did Jairus approach? Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 and verse 22. Mark chapter 5 and verse 22 says this. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now let's let's look let's look at a few things in this. I want to, I want to highlight that phrase one of the rulers of the synagogue. You know there is not a single word in the Bible that that is not there without purpose. And it's easy to jump over this and just think oh the Bible's just giving us a bit of information about him. No, there's something in that. Let's see let's see what this is. We're told who Jairus is. He's he's one he's the one of the rulers of the synagogue. Every every town had a synagogue. Every city they were all over the place by then. Uh, the synagogue was not the temple. It's a different different thing entirely. The synagogue, uh, there was one in each town, and people would gather to to read the the, the law, to hear the, the the reading of the law. And Jairus, the Bible tells us, was one of the rulers of the synagogue in that area. Now, I love this because, you know, when I think about the, the, the religious people, the rulers of the synagogue, I tend to think about like Luke 13, where Jesus healed the woman uh, who, who had been bent over for many years. We haven't studied that one yet. We'll study that in a few weeks time. Uh, but that ruler of the synagogue, he got indignant and angry when Jesus healed. That, that ruler of the synagogue uh, was not open to Jesus' ministry. Now, most of the time when we think about the religious leaders under G, uh, the, the, in the Gospels, we think of them opposing Jesus' ministry. We think of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the critics, the ones who tried to stop Jesus. So I, I, I think it's significant that the Bible points out that Jairus was one of the rulers of the synagogue. Because he was a religious leader, however, he did not approach Jesus with the same mindset as all the other religious leaders. He was different. There was something different about this man. In fact, and we'll mention it in a moment, it says that when he came to Jesus, he fell on his feet. He knelt before him. This man was not caught up in, in who he was. You know, He could have come to Jesus and said, do you know who I am? I'm one of the rulers of the synagogue. You come and heal my daughter and, and I will give your ministry status. I can promote you in this town, Jesus. If, you, if you, you do this for me, I'll do something for you. He could have relied upon his position. He, he could have relied on who he was in the natural. And a lot of people try to do that with God. You know, I, I love the thing. One of the things about God is God's not really that concerned about all your self-importance who you are in the natural. It doesn't mean a lot to him. Whether you're, you're living on the street or whether you live in a, in a 20 million pound mansion or even more expensive, you're equal before God. God's not impressed if you're the president, the prime minister, the king, the queen, or, you, or, or you're a homeless person on the street or a drug addict. It makes no difference before God. Your position, your status in life means nothing. If you try to approach God because of who you are, God's not impressed. And, and Jairus, even though the Bible tells us he was the ruler of the synagogue, you don't see in his approach that he's relying on who he, he was. He didn't come demanding to Jesus and say, you come with me. I'm the religious leader around here. And I, and you, you're, you, you, he didn't, you know, he came himself. That's the other thing. He didn't send a messenger to do it for him and think, because I'm so important, I can't go to Jesus myself. This man's attitude comes out 
when you look at look at the request and how he approached Jesus. See, no matter who you are, we're all equal before God. I love that. I call faith the great equalizer. Some people think faith is, is almost like it's hard or it's tough or some people have it easier than others. That's not the case. Every single person has the same potential to believe God. Doesn't matter what your education is. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter what your social status is. Doesn't matter where you were born. Doesn't matter if you were born in the right, the right family, the wrong family. Doesn't matter if you were disadvantaged. Doesn't matter if you, you were born in a rough part of town and, and, and were surrounded by gangs and criminals. Makes no difference whatsoever to God. Faith equalizes everybody. That's why I love the fact that the Bible says we come by faith. We come believing. If you understand faith, you'll understand that is that puts everybody on a, an equal level, level before God. Nobody has an extra advantage over anybody else. If you try to come relying on who you are and think that gives you an advantage, God's not impressed. See, one, there's a man in the Bible who tried that, Naaman. Uh, he tried to come before uh, Elisha the prophet. And he, he was so, felt he was so important. He was a great military leader. And he came with all his, his fanfare and all the, his, you know, his big military parade and arrived at the prophet's house. And he wanted the prophet to be impressed and the prophet to come out and think, oh, wow, I've got a great military leader out here. How can I help you? And you know what the prophet did? The prophet stayed in his house and he sent his servant out to go and talk to, to Naaman because he wasn't the least bit um, impressed. See, there's too much of that. There's far too much of that these days. Ministers, ministers play, play on the fact that, oh, I need to impress the important people. No, God doesn't do that. Elisha sent his servant out to, to name and, and said to him, just go dip in the river Jordan seven times and you'll be healed. And in fact, that, that, that was humiliating for Naaman. Naaman was like, huh? Who, who did he, I thought he would come out to me and be impressed and because I'm someone great and wonderful. See, he didn't, he, God didn't play to that. And the pro, that's why the prophet responded the way he did. And I think we need to understand, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you, you have no significance, no importance. It doesn't matter if you think I'm a nobody. Who's ever going to notice me? You have the same potential to approach God with faith than that anybody else has. Faith is the great equalizer. And I love that. Puts every single one of us on the same status before God. So Jairus, the Bible points out in Mark 5.22, it says Jairus was one of the rulers of the synagogue. And we're told that because he was a man of status and position. And yet nothing about his position got his, got his request answered. It wasn't He didn't get Jesus' help because of who he was. He got Jesus' help because he approached correctly. Now notice this. Let's look at his approach. It says there, Mark 5, 25, Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, the moment I read that, I'm reminded of the leper. It reminds me of the fact that, remember the leper did that. He knelt before Jesus when he asked. I think sometimes kneeling before God is a bit un underrated these days. We seem to have forgotten how to do it. Sometimes you do when you want to ask God. Sometimes you need to get on your knees. And it's an act of humility. It's an act of submission. Um, uh, the different translations, Mark says, when he saw me, he fell at his feet. Matthew said he came and he worshipped him. He, uh, Luke says he fell down at Jesus' feet. Now, remember what I said at the start of today's teaching. This is a man whose daughter was dying that very moment. She was on her deathbed. This is a desperate situation. This man could have thought, I don't have time to kneel. I just need to get to Jesus. And he could have, like the, the nobleman being so desperate, just Jesus, come and do something. But no, this is a man whose heart was probably in agony over, over the fact that his daughter was dying that very moment. When he, sh he should have been sitting, in the natural, he should have been sitting by his daughter's deathbed, holding her hand, crying and saying goodbye. But instead, he's on his face. He's kneeling before Jesus. That shows something. This man's heart must have been hurting. And yet he humbled himself and he got on his knees and he didn't focus on the desperate situation. He began to worship. He began to humble himself before he even requested anything. I love that. That's how you approach God. 
It doesn't matter how desperate your situation is. Sometimes people bypass these things. They jump past these things because they, oh, it's so desperate. I'm feeling the pressure. God help, God help, God help. No, get your eyes off the pressure. Get on your knees and say, before I even ask God anything, I'm going to worship you, Father God. I'm going to worship you and I'm going to declare you are amazing. You're wonderful. I'm going to focus on you as, as before I even request anything. That is not the way we do things naturally. And because we don't do things like that, we don't get the results. Uh, it, you know, I, I was saying this to the Bible school students that I teach uh, this last weekend during, during Bible school. And I said to them, you know, God is not looking for your praise and your worship because he wants you to feed his ego. God's not sitting up there saying, I want you to tell me how wonderful I am. Come on, feed me. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. God's not a big ego based God. Praise and, and, and declaring God, you're amazing. A lot of the times it actually helps us. The reason God gets us to say, God, you are great. You are amazing. You are the almighty God is because it, it, it adjusts our focus. It gets our focus off of ourselves. And, 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 and you see, in order for faith to work, I believe you've got to get your, fo your focus off yourself. Um, this is something I wrote this down right before I started tonight's teaching. I wrote this down. Faith is not arrogance. Faith is dependence. See, a lot of people think that, that, that when you're in faith and they think it's almost about, oh, I'm this great man. I'm this great faith man, me and my faith. And I think sometimes faith has become very focused on me, the, my ability to have great faith. But actually, it's not, it's not an arrogance. It, it, it's more about faith as an attitude, a humble attitude of complete dependence and reliance and focus upon God. That's why I said faith is not arrogance. Faith is dependence. And I, and I wrote this down right before the teaching tonight. It, it says this, faith is not focused on me, my abilities, my problem, or who I am and what I can achieve. So often people, they, they say, I am believing God, but they get so caught up in focusing on themselves and, and, and their ability and my ability to believe God. No, faith focuses on God. Faith puts complete focus on him first, not my problem, not my challenge, not my situation. The first thing faith does is focus on God. And that's why when Jairus in Mark 5, when he approached Jesus, despite how desperate his situation was, his daughter was right about to die that very moment. This is a desperate man hurting his only daughter. He's about to lose her. And yet he approaches Jesus and kneels and worships. Instead of, Jesus, I need you. Come do this. I'm the ruler of the synagogue. You need to come and do this for me. None of that. He wasn't focused upon himself. See, this is where people have missed it a lot of the time with faith. If you want to really step into the power of, 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 of faith, it's about getting your attention off you. And it's about getting your focus upon God and upon his word. And I'm talking about now how to approach God. When you approach God, the first thing you do is focus on him. Not your problem. Not your sins either. So many people come before God and they're like, oh God, I'm so terrible. I'm so awful. I've done bad things. No, that's not how to approach God. Leave that for later on in the prayers. When you approach God, focus on him first every time. Come before God and say, Father, you are God. You sent your son, Jesus. The blood of Jesus is, 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 is why I can approach you. That's how to approach God. Every prayer you pray, put your focus on him first. And, and Jairus did that. I believe that's one of the powerful things about this man. It, it, despite his status as the ruler of the synagogue, he was someone important. Despite the desperation of the situation uh, that he was facing, despite the crisis, the first thing he did was humble himself and worship. He got on his knees and he approached with humility. <coughs> and and that that that's just an eye opener. People people haven't seen that about faith. Faith's not arrogance, it's dependence. I'm gonna read that again. Faith is not focused on me, my problems, my ability, who I am, or what I can achieve. Faith is focused on God 
a humility toward him and reliance on his word. Now, the more you can get that part of your faith going, the more you can approach in humility and begin to speak out who God is, the greater results you'll get. Now, let's look at the next part of this with Jairus. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to go through Jairus and then I'm going to take you to a scripture in the Bible, which is going to show you every principle that I've been teaching about how to pro- approach God. It's all in one passage. We'll get there in a minute. Mark chapter 5. Uh, verse 23. So we've seen this man. He came, he worshipped, he got on his knees, he fell at his feet and worshipped Jesus, approached with humility. Let's look at Mark 25, verse, uh, sorry, sorry, Mark 5, verse 23. It says, and he begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Matthew, Matthew says this, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Um, Luke says he begged him to come to his house, but it doesn't tell him what he actually said. And that's fine because that's why it's good to study the different gospel uh, accounts because some of them summarize it. But Matthew and Mark both tell us what he said. And what he said in his request is important because it shows us the, the right way to approach, the, the right way to approach. Now, it says that Jairus begged. Some people say, oh, well, you see, he begged. Well, that's wrong. It's, begging's not wrong when it's a form of request, as long as there's faith involved in it. See, just coming and begging, God, please, God, please, God, please. If there's no faith in that, if there's just a God, please, and there's no declaration of faith, then, then, then it's just begging. Okay. Now, we're, a lot of times we're told, people say to us, oh, approach God in faith. You must come believing. And, and people wonder, how do I know when I'm in faith? How do I know when I'm approaching God believing? I'm going to show you tonight. I'm going to show you what is involved in the, the approach that, is gonna, that means it is a, an approach of faith. It's not just some a passive believing in my heart while I throw out a desperate request. That's not, that's not asking in faith. That's not approaching in faith. Notice Jairus's words. Notice what he said. His faith was verbal. It was present. It was evident in the request itself. This is where a lot of people are not are, are missing it in their so-called I am asking God in faith. Because they think just because it's some kind of passive faith in their heart that 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 yes, in deep in my heart, I believe while I'm asking. No, that's not asking in faith. Notice the, the, this man's words. Um he tells him the crisis. My little daughter lies at the point of death. That's fine. He's giving, he's letting him know what the problem is. But then he says this, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Notice the certainty. Notice the confidence in his, in what he's declaring. He is showing absolute confidence in Jesus and in what Jesus will do. He is saying, all you need to do is put your hand on her and she'll live. This man is not sitting here wondering if he's not uncertain. He's not questioning. He's not doubting. He's not saying, well, you know, let's see what happens. He's not saying to Jesus, you know, I've tried everything else. I thought I'd try you and see if that helps. See, there's a lot of people these days that tell us you should not approach God with such confidence. I'm going to tell you they're wrong. That is that is not accurate. The Bible shows that the people, when they approached Jesus, the ones that were in faith were the ones who verbally spoke out, touch, you, you, you do this and my daughter, my son, my, I will be healed. Positive, uh, absolute declarations of confidence, showing the fact that I have absolute confidence in Jesus. I have absolute confidence in God. Jairus's words showed confidence in Jesus and, 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 and showed that he was not just absorbed in the problem. Uh, you see, and again, if you think back at the different cases we've looked at so far, the nobleman did not show that. When he, when he asked Jesus, he just cried out. He showed no confidence in Jesus whatsoever until after Jesus spoke to him and adjusted him. And then he had confidence in, in Jesus. Um, but, but you know, Jairus verbalized his assurance. That's what I want you to get a hold of today. When you ask God every single time, if you're coming before God for healing, don't just say, Lord, I need healing. Heal me. That's not how to approach God correctly. I I want you to understand. This is why I'm spending extra time on this tonight. Get the approach correct and you'll get more results. The first thing you do, if you need healing, the first thing you do is but you worship, you get on your knees and you begin to say, Father, I thank you. You are the healer. 
I thank you that that healing is in your word. And begin to begin to verbalize declarations of confidence. I believe that that when I ask you, you hear me and you answer my prayers. I believe that 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 you are the healer. And when I when I when when you, when I, when I approach you and I come before you, I believe that your healing power touches my life and sets me free. These are declar- verbalize that faith, declarations of what you believe, declarations of who God is. Put that before your request. This is how you approach God in faith. This is how you come before him, showing God, I believe you. Hebrews 11, 6, he who comes to God must believe. Verbalize it. See, the two blind men, when they asked Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us. They followed Jesus across town, finally got into the house. Jesus turned to them and the first thing he did was get them to verbally declare the fact that they believed. Didn't matter that they'd been requesting. He said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And it was only when they verbally said, yes, Lord, we believe. Then Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be unto you. If you if, 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 don't just say, I believe in my heart, verbalize it. Put verbal declarations of faith in the request itself. That's how, see how we approach God. The way we approach makes all the difference. Our words Declare, speak words that show confidence in God. The show, speak words that show that I believe that, that God will do what he said in his word he will do for me. Verbalize it. If, if, you, if you need your, if you're praying for, if you need financial things and you've got challenges, go in and declare before you even ask God, Lord, please, I need my bills paid. That's not how to approach correctly. Okay, let's learn this from Jesus. Let's learn this from the ministry. The way to approach is to first begin to get, humble yourself, get on your knees and say, Father, you are the provider. I believe that you are the one who takes care of me. I believe you are the Lord, my shepherd. And you said in your word, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I believe that you are the God who, who provides and takes care of me. You are El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough, the all-sufficient one. And Father, I believe that when I ask you that, that you always do exceeding abundantly above what, you, what, what I ask or what I could even imagine. Begin to speak out declarations of, that, of, what, of who you believe God is. At the start of how many, how, many, how many times should we do this? Should we do this every third prayer, every 20th prayer, every 15th request? No, every single time. When you are come to God, make that a habit of how you approach him every time. Speak out who he is in relation to what you're coming to him for. Declarations of that. I believe that is how you ask in faith. That is how you come believing. And if we'd get that right, we'd, we'd experience more results. Now, let me, let, me, let me show you a passage in the Bible I believe there's a passage which summarizes a lot of the principles we've been teaching in this series, and it's all laid out in one passage. Look look with me. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to see this. I want you to understand this passage because this is, this is powerful. This is important. Hebrews chapter 10 shows us exactly how we to, are to approach God. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19 says this, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a verse 20, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Okay, I'm going to read that again, because I'm going to break this down verse by verse. I'm going to show you the progression of this passage. It, It teaches the principles I've been sharing with you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter. Yes, we come boldly. That's the one we haven't yet spoken much about. But the Bible does teach to come into his presence boldly. But it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest. Notice this. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. In other words, when you're coming into the holiest. This, if you're just joining us, this, we're in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. When you are coming into the holy, see, this is talking about entering the holiness. That's the holiest. In other words, approaching God. When you're coming before him, it says this, you come by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. In other words, Jesus. Jesus is the way. 
In other words, you don't come relying on yourself. That's what we saw with Jairus. He didn't come relying on the fact that I am the ruler of the synagogue. I'm someone amazing. Look at me, God. You should answer my prayers because of who I am and what I've done. No, none of the approach has got anything to do with who you are. You come by the fact when you approach God, this is how you come. You say, Father, I come because I have confidence in the fact of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. I can approach because of the cross. I don't come because I'm anyone amazing or anyone special. I come because of what Jesus has done. I come and, and the way I enter into your presence is by that precious blood of Jesus. And I come with reliance upon what Jesus has done for me. That's step one. Okay, Hebrews 10 verse 19 and 20. Um, I'll read that again. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So we come approaching him. And, and we saw that with Jairus. He didn't rely on who, who he was. Okay, we, we, we base our approach upon him and verbalize it. This is the key. This is what I'm trying to get through to you. Verbalize it. Verbally acknowledge these things. Don't just say, yes, I know in my heart I'm approaching because of the blood of Jesus and because of what Jesus did. No, this is where people are getting it wrong. Verbalize it. Your own ears need to hear this every time you approach God. When you come before him, verbalize. I'm coming because of Jesus. I'm able to enter because of Jesus. And because of what Jesus did for me. Now let's continue on to the next verse. Hebrews 10 verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God. Verse 22. Let us draw near. Now let me just pause on that word for a second. The word draw near. Um, although it is translated differently. The Greek word there is the exact same Greek word. Used in Hebrews 11 verse 6. When it says he who comes to God. That word comes is the exact same word here used in Hebrews 10 verse 22 when it says let us draw near. In other words, let us come. Let us approach. This this passage is teaching you how to approach God. Let us approach or let us draw near. Let us come and notice the next the next few words with a true heart. With a true heart in full assurance of faith. There it is. This passage is laying these things out as I've been t what I've been teaching you. Let us come, how? With a true heart. That's what I started off tonight with, with Jairus. He, he came in humility. Humility is an attitude of heart. Humility is, is in fact, the, the, the phrase there, a true heart. The word true, it, it's, it, it, the word means sincere and genuine. It talks about the opposite of fictitious or, or counterfeit or imaginary. In other words, you're not approaching God with any front, with any kind of, you know, oh God, you know, I'm someone wonderful. Look at me. That's all fake. That's fake. There's people are so fake. When you approach God, you come with a with a with a, a hu humility, no pre no pretense, with a true attitude of saying, God, I'm coming before you, acknowledging that I can't do this myself, but I know you can. That's genuine before God, not trying to act about who, how wonderful and great you are. And, and uh, so come, let us come, let us draw near, Hebrews 10, 22, with a true heart. So the attitude of heart, humility, just like Jairus knelt, he worshipped. There was humility in his heart toward Jesus. Let us come, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, there it is. Now, I don't care how many people say, oh, you don't need faith with God. Over and over and over and over, the Bible shows this is how you come. This is how you approach. Come with a full assurance of faith. Now, what I've been trying to say, for those of you who've joined us a bit late, what I've been trying to say is that requesting, asking God for things, when it's not just a passive I'm in faith in my heart. Yes, I have faith. I ask God, God help me. But in my heart, I believe. No, verbalize the belief. That's what I'm trying to get through to you tonight. And, and I'm being redundant because this is so vital. We don't do this. Verbalize it. When you come with a full assurance of faith, that's what Jairus did. He said, he begged him, come, come, come and lay your hands on her. But then he showed his full assurance of faith. He says, because when you lay your hands upon her, she will be healed and she will live. That is a full assurance, a confidence in Jesus. And that is J.R. is saying to Jesus, I am fully assured that you will do this and that she will be healed. 
So Hebrews said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so this, this whole passage is laying out what I call the protocol, how to approach God. And I believe Jairus did this. Um, and let's, let's just look at the next verse, Hebrews 10 verse 23, because it's not quite finished yet. It's telling us how to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, showing assurance and confidence in God. Hebrews 10 23, the next verse says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast. Hold fast means hold on to it. Take it and don't let it go. And that's what I've been talking to you about for the last few weeks where I've talked about determination. Let us hold fast without wavering. Wavering there means letting go of it and, 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 and oh, it's hard. Oh, it's tough. No, hold on. Hold fast. Once you've declared, once you've approached God in humility and you've verbalized your faith and your belief in him, then you hold on and you determine, you say, I'm not letting this go. It, it, it means that to keep holding on, don't drift off track. And we've seen that in this series so far. We've seen the woman with the issue of blood, the two blind men, the man lowered through the roof. All of them had to hold on, hold fast and be determined uh, in, in order to get it. That's why I say this passage in Hebrews 10 summarizes what I've been teaching so far. And, and, I, and I wanted to go through that. Now, now just for, for those of you who are joining, I'm doing two teachings tonight. I'm going to do a second one at 8.30 because I, I wanted to use the first one to summarize this approach, to talk about, to reaffirm some things that we've, we've been going through. But I wanted to put them into one teaching. And then we're going to do a second teaching. We're going because we're not finished with Jairus. Now, initially, I was thinking, oh, do I do this over two weeks or do I do this all on one night? And I just felt, no, go for it, go for it on one night, and do a second one. We're going to look at what happened next. You're going to see that even when Jesus, when Jairus approached Jesus correctly, Jesus responded. He went with them, and then everything went wrong. Everything started to go wrong. Even though Jairus got his approach correct. So I'm going to look at, in the, in, 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 at 8.30, we're going to start another one. I'm going to look at, you know, once you've approached God correctly, what happens when everything starts to go wrong? How do you deal with it then? Because you're going to find that the answer is not only in Jairus, but it's also in the same passage in Hebrews 10 that we're reading. This passage goes on and talks about what to do after the request. Okay? So, uh, but, but we're going to just finalize this about the request. How did, now, let's, let's look at this. How did Jairus respond to, sorry, how did Jesus respond to Jairus' request? I love this. Je, Jesus instantly, it, it says in Mark 5 verse 24, so Jesus went with him. Matthew said, so Jesus arose and, uh, and followed him. And Luke implies, it doesn't state it, but it implies he goes with him by the, what happens next. Okay, I love this. That when Jairus got the approach correct, there was no hesitation from Jesus. See, with the nobleman, the nobleman didn't get his approach correct. And that's why Jesus, he asked Jesus, come with me. And Jesus said no. <laughs> well, he didn't verbalize, say no. But the way he responded was, I'm not coming with you. He said, what you need to do is get your focus off the desperation and get your focus on my word. And Jesus just spoke a word and he had to adjust his focus. But in this situation, Jesus just went with Jairus. Why? Jairus got his approach right. Every part of this is important. He's a ruler of a syn the synagogue, but he's not, count he's not relying on who he is. The first thing he does when he comes to Jesus is he worships. Despite the fact that his daughter is about to die, he's feeling the agony of a father literally losing his daughter that day. And yet he humbles himself and he worships and he gets on his knees and then he begins to verbally speak out. When you, if you come with me and you touch her, she will be healed. That's how to approach God correctly. And then you hold on to that. Hold fast. So like I said, you know, Jesus immediately responded. He went with them. When you get the approach right, God gets involved. When you get that, when you get these different keys into place. That's what I want you to see tonight is that 
You see, after this, in these teachings, we're going to move on from the approach. We've spent a lot of time talking about the approach, and that's why I'm summarizing it all in this session. Okay, let me give you some examples. Let me show you how to do this. Because, you know, it's, it's all good and well to teach, but let, let me again show you how to, how, how to do this. You know, if you need, if, if you're needing healing, it's not just a matter of God, God, I ask you to heal me. No, that's not, that's not how we do that. That is not the biblical pattern. That's what it, people do all the time. If you need healing, the first thing you do is you begin to come and say, Father, begin to acknowledge who he is. You're the healer. I, 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 and and it, it's, come with humility. Get on your knees if you have to. It's not a lot enough requesting where people are getting on their knees in worship and they begin to say, I'm getting my eyes off of the problem. I'm getting my eyes off the situation, the challenge, the desperation. Even though I'm feeling the pressure of this, I'm going to get my eyes off that and I'm going to get my eyes on you first. And I'm going to begin to worship you and declare who you are. You're an amazing God and I worship you. I I thank you that Jesus died for me. I can come into your presence by the blood of Jesus. And I come now focused on you and I declare you're the healer. You take care of me. I know that when I ask you, you are the covenant keeping God. I know that when I ask you, you keep your promises, you fulfill your word. And I and you see that's showing confidence and assurance in him. And the more you do that, the more you begin to verbal, verbally put faith into your request by acknowledging who God is and humility and the fact that you are dependent upon him, I believe you'll get a lot more results. That is how to approach God correctly. And I encourage you, as I, as I said to the Bible school students this last weekend, don't do that just some of your requests. Learn to do that every time you request. Every time you ask from God, do this. This is the way to approach him. Acknowledge who he is, declare who he is, speak out who he is, and then bring your request in as part of that. Amen. So I'm, I, as I said, I'm doing two teachings tonight for those of you who've just joined us. This, the first one is a summary of some of the things we've looked at about how to approach God. And so I've done, we've done that now. I'm just going to take a five minute break. I'm going to come back at 830 and we're going to look at the second part of Jairus. And we're going to look at what happened next. Jesus got involved in this situation with Jairus, but right after that, everything went wrong. Jairus didn't face one challenge. I believe he faced about four obstacles and challenges that stood in his way and tried to stop him getting a result. And those, those different challenges that Jairus faced, each one of them he had to work through, he had to come out properly at the other end in order to get all the way to his victory, even though he approached correctly. So we're going to look at that. And uh, in, as I said, in about five minutes, I'll be back with a second teaching for tonight. So I just I, I thank you all for joining us. And I really hope if you can, you're welcome to join us for the second teaching. If you can't catch it up later, but I hope you can you can watch the second one. And the, you can always catch up on these different teachings. Uh, I'm building up a page on my website, which would, which links to all the videos. So instead of having to scroll through the Facebook page or, or try and find the, where each video is, I'm putting one page together where there's a link to every one of these videos. You can just open it up. If you want to share it with friends, you can. I'll, I'll have to give. I'll have to put the, web, the, the 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 link to that specific page in the comments. But you, if you want to share this with friends and you think they need all of these videos, that's the page to give them because they can go there. They can find the full list and and just click on each one and watch the video through. So thank you for watching this. And I hope you can join us in about five minutes again for a second broadcast where we're going to look at the second part of Jairus. God bless you all. Thank you very much for, for joining us for this first broadcast tonight.